Okay, the meeting is being recorded, and I'm going to flip us over. Hold on to your seat. Click. I'm going to jump into the presentation mode, and we can get going. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I'm based on the Cornell University campus in Ithaca, New York, and I want to offer my appreciation to the Cornell University Cooperative Extension uh, for their and the Ag Experiment Station. They've played two different roles. Cooperative Extension extends the knowledge and the Ag Experiment Station helps develop that knowledge. And they have um, uh, both been uh, active in supporting both the technology that we're using as well as the, the programs that have um, that have led to some of this information. The uh, as I was mentioning earlier, usually Cooperative Extension and other educational groups will rely heavily on research-based knowledge. Uh, the idea of low-impact logging in uh, particular and to a lesser extent small-scale woodlot management is, is not, I'll say, is not rich in research-based knowledge. There is certainly research that goes into this, but this is also an opportunity for me and you to uh, share some ideas. So as we get going through this, there will be specific points where I'll be wanting the foresters who are present and the forest owners who are present to, uh, and others, uh, as you see fit, to, to chime in and share some of your experiences and some of your observations. So let's start with a few definitions. And, and again, we don't, I'm not going to say that this is a, uh, a hard and fast definition, but when I think about what uh, comes to my mind when I talk to woodland owners about small-scale woodlot management. I'm thinking about the strategies, the equipment, and the scales of operation that support sustainability on small woodlands. As a general rule, that also involves landowners um, as a participant in that process. Now, they may landowners will participate at different levels. Some will be very involved. Some will be less involved. Um, but the key things here are that that it's a scale of operation and there's landowner involvement and of course as with all forest management it should be sustainable. Uh, if we look then at, at low impact logging uh, from a small scale woodlot management and in some places you're going to see um, you're going to see a uh, reference to SSWM and that's small scale woodlot management. This is Again, my definition, not a textbook definition, but harvesting of woodland products uh, that prioritizes the lack of damage and is often done with small equipment, but not that's not a prerequisite that it is done with uh, small equipment. Low impact logging is more about the outcome than about how it happens. We'll talk more about that later. I've just show some pictures, examples of of a of a farm tractor of horse logging. Well, this isn't this is a horse logging simulation. Uh, where they had a competition. This was on uh, the Trumansburg area last year. Um, and and uh, horse loggers are people that had horses and liked to move logs. I don't think all of them were loggers. Uh, got together and they had a course for their horses. And then things like ATVs and arches. So, so what I want to uh, hit on are five different objectives. And this is why it's a fairly full um, uh, presentation. But as we're, as we're uh, going through this, again, if you have comments or questions, please don't hesitate to put those into the chat pod. I'll try to watch, even though the screens are side by side, I tend to focus more on the, um, on the PowerPoint presentation. And, the, uh, uh, and, and I'll try to watch the chat. I see Norm was having trouble with that. Um, uh, you've got a, you've got a, pop-up block message. So Norm, you need to change your, your pop-up blockers. If you send, if you have trouble, let's see here. Um, if you can't get to that continuing education, send me an email and I'll send you a direct link to that website. So today's objectives. First, I want to discuss some of the advantages and realities associated with small-scale woodlot management. We'll talk about why and how small-scale woodlot management happens. I have some, what I've thought of as some recommendations for owners and for foresters who want to uh, pursue small-scale woodlot management. From an owner's perspective, it's a chance to be more involved and to be safe. And my priority almost throughout all of this is really on safety. 
uh, for owners and other people. And for foresters, I think there's a chance for foresters to expand their opportunities to build relationships with woodland owners and, and essentially to, to broaden their uh, business uh, portfolio, if you will. There are some strategies of low impact harvesting that I'll share. And I, I, most of my experiences with ATV harvesting, I'm not trying to sell ATVs over other types of tractors or small skidders or UTVs. We had a picture up of a, of a UTV earlier. Uh, whatever it is, whatever the tool is that you use, there are some, some strategies that I think would, will play out. And then I want to get your ideas uh, because, as I said, there's not a huge uh, research base for this. So uh, the ideas that you can share on how to make this happen will be useful, and I will, um, I will uh, incorporate those and make them available to other people. So what are some of we've defined it, but what are some of the defining characteristics of small-scale woodlot management? One, it's typically small equipment. Uh, this is largely because you don't need large equipment. It's not a matter of productivity. It's a matter of having sizing your equipment to match the need. It also tends to be small acreage, and that may be the, the total ownership of the parcel. So it may be 5 acres or 10 acres or 20 acres, or it may be the amount of acreage that is owned. Uh, so maybe you have 50 acres or 100 acres, but the work that, that you do in any given year only happens on 3 acres or 5 acres. This presents those small acreages, presents some challenges, if you will, from, from an operational perspective, particularly if you want it to be commercial. Or if you had uh, a management plan, we'll talk about management planning a little bit uh, later in this presentation, where you wanted to get something done, you wanted to wanted to create some new um, situation or condition in your woods on a 30 acre block, let's say, if you're doing it three acres at a clip, that's going to take you a decade. So that's, there are some, some uh, challenges with that. And another defining characteristic is that it's personal. And this is uh, not to be underestimated, particularly for foresters who are building relationships, uh, uh, working with small woodlot owners. Um, it's, it's, you know, the, many of the owners have no, each individual tree on their property and the foresters realize this and the owners realize this, but it's a very personal thing and, and, um, and it takes a different type of mindset, um, to work with that. I, I found that when, um, before I owned a uh, woodlot, my wife and I bought woods about five years ago. Before that, walking woods with woodland owners is very easy to talk about, well, cut, you should cut this tree, cut that tree, and do this and do that. And then when you own the trees, it's, uh, it's a very different kind of thinking about the trees that you own. Some other characteristics, it's, it should be low impact. Uh, productivity is not a top priority, and this uh, comes back time and time again. Uh, woodland owners are saying, I'm not doing this for production. They want to have some level of production. They have, may have some production goals, but it's very different than the types of productivity goals you have with commercial operations. Woodland owners will need to improvise rather than capitalize. Uh, part of that flows from the fact that productivity is not a priority. If, if it if it's, tends to be low productivity, it's also going to be low revenue generating, and so you're not going to have the funds necessarily to buy the stuff that you want, the toys, the tools, so you need to improvise and be creative. These parcels and the, and the desired scale of operation are typically too small to attract commercial assistance. Um, and uh, linked with that, of course, is that if you're not going to have, if you can't hire somebody to do it, at least to do it on a revenue generating um, basis, then you're going to have to do it yourself. So why do people want to get involved in small-scale woodlot management? Uh, and this is, you know, this is not a human dimensions research uh, summary here. It's just based on my own personal experience and based on the conversations I've had with woodland owners. But there are several reasons why people like this. They want to get um, a more directly, have a greater direct influence on what their woodland is going to look like and what it's going to produce. And this is the picture that you're seeing is a picture from my woodlot in the eastern Adirondacks where I was doing a forest health thinning. Uh, this is up in Essex County, for those of you familiar with New York. And, 
and I'd marked several of the, I marked all the ugly, basically the, the marking guide was to mark the ugly trees. And so I went in and marked all the small and the ugly trees and left behind a, a desirable uh, number of trees per acre. But it gave me a chance to be directly involved in what was happening on my land. Um, it may or may not save you money to be involved with this. If you didn't do anything, it probably, it, you know, I've spent a lot of money to be involved with small woodlot management. Um, but it's, um, in the long run, I want to believe it's going to save you money and produce more. So it allows you to work at your own pace. It's great exercise. Um, you can work at your own scale. And that's by scale, I mean spatial scale. If you want to focus on one or two acres, that's fine. If you want to focus on five or ten acres, that's fine. It does help you build family relationships and friendships uh, because you're going to need to, to enhance the networks that you have access to. And through that and, and meeting other woodland owners, you're going to also gain a lot from that knowledge. You can minimize the impact because you're not focused on productivity because you're often doing the work. You can take the time to do it the way you want to do it. And you can generate a small scale sustained yield. You can still have a sustained yield if you, let's say you had 30 or 40 acres and you had a commercial timber harvest, that could still be a sustained yield, but on a uh, much longer time interval. So everything is everything is drawn down to a smaller spatial scale, um, and and because of that, perhaps a shortened temporal scale as well. Small scale woodlot management gives you some opportunities. Here's uh, some of the logs that came off of our property. Um, none of them are are particularly uh, delightful looking logs, but they were enough to work with a local neighbor and and have uh, have some boards on and I built a barn from it so and you saw the 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 opportunity and the delight is to be able to produce your own products whether it's firewood or boards or beams or building trails these are things that 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 you can take personal satisfaction in you'll improve your understanding of forest ecology and management this has been a you know for me as an optimist I like to look at a at a tree that has sweep in it and think that I can still cut straight boards from that. And that's uh, you know, the, the under my understanding of reality is, has, been, has been refined and enhanced because the saw blade cuts straight irrespective of how much sweep you have in the, in the log. It's great fun for me. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's mentally relaxing and you know, the, for the, my, my involvement in small scale woodlot management is, deals a lot with thinning and, and so I, I talk about my idea of recreation is to go out and make stumps. And that's, uh, that gives me great fun and a lot of personal satisfaction because I can see the results of that work as uh, you can when you work in your woods. And you learn. Every time you go into the woods, you're going to learn because you're part of the process and you're experiencing what's happening. So there are some truisms and uh, what I think of as truisms. Uh, I want to share these and they will... I, I, I do this because um, sometimes people see presentations and they think there's a, a, a single cut and dried way. There are some there are some similarities among all properties, but there's also some things that that differ. Uh, but these truisms, I think, will hopefully help us uh, primarily keep us safe, but also help us think outside the box. The first truism is that every person and every property are different. This is a a picture of of a of a, uh, a group of people who are participating uh, in a game of logging or a version of a game of logging workshop. Uh, it was a, a small scale harvesting workshop. This is Bill Lindloff in the orange T-shirt. He's the New York certified game of logging instructor, and these are members of the local NIFOA, New York Forest Owners Association chapter, and it just highlights the fact that everybody's different and everybody's going to have different um, needs and desires from their property and different resources to bring to their property and different skill sets, and so the way you solve a problem is going to be different than the way your neighbor solves their problem, and that's okay. Uh, you can learn from your neighbor. Um, but don't think that you need to do things the same way. Another important truism is that if you're active in the woods, you can kill yourself or you, or you can kill someone else. And um, I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but every year you and I hear 
um, uh, you know, you and I hear stories about people that get killed in the woods or get severely injured or get crippled. So uh, everything that you do, take it seriously. Um, uh, just because you are uh, working with, uh, just because you're working with um, on a small scale and you're doing it yourself, you're using tools that are, are uh, typically used by professional loggers or other kinds of professional contractors and you need to be um, give them the respect that they deserve. This for me was a was a hard lesson, um, one that was a challenge to. Uh, um, I have to keep reminding myself of it. Low impact is low productivity. Um, you, it's really hard to produce. And I've, I've, I've you know, I don't work as a in, in the commercial production of forest products per se. I've been around it. I've seen the kinds of productivity that can come out of the woods. And when you have a, an ATV and an arch or some kind of a, of a small operating machine, and you're bringing your logs out one at a time, um, you really get a sense for that low, the low, the low productivity. It's truly low impact. And the thinning that, that you're seeing here, um, this was part of that that stand thinning that I did, to my knowledge, I bumped on on about 38 acres of thinning. I bumped one tree, so that was and that was a very small. I think I'll show a picture of that one tree later. That was a uh, it was a low impact, you know. But I'm bringing out. I'm averaging about 100 board feet per hour with this kind of a setup. You're going to change your woodlot. Um, you're either going to improve it or you're going to degrade it. So because of that, you will likely need assistance. And just because woodland owners are often um, heavily involved in, in the execution of small woodlot ownership objectives, that doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily do it without some kind of assistance. So being able to hire a forester, working with your state forestry agency, working with your a cooperative extension office working with your forest owner association you're going to need some assistance and there will be damage and this is the this is the damage that I did now admittedly it was on a six inch diameter hemlock tree so the economic loss that I suffered was small but there is the potential to do damage so you need to be um, conscious of that as you move forward you're also going to need to spend some money um, this uh, after the after the third bullet there, low impact equals low productivity. This was the next hardest one for me. Uh, in addition to being an optimist, I'm also a cheapskate. Uh, I initially thought as and this was a, a firewood cart that I bought right after we purchased our property. And my thinking was, I'll go out and I'll cut the woods, cut the wood. I'll make firewood, and then my wife and daughters will use the cart and pull the firewood out of the woods. And uh, in my mind, that that was a pretty, pretty straightforward and obvious solution to the need to move wood. Um, I didn't uh, maybe discuss that as much as I should, and and um, I may have to admit that this is perhaps the only time that firewood cart's ever been loaded. But the point of it is, you're going to have to spend some money. Um, you can start small and you can work up as you need to, um, but don't think that you're going to be able to do this on the cheap. You're going to find that you'll uh, you'll create some, or you will you will uh, you'll benefit from creative solutions. You know, if you got if you have to accomplish something, you can use the tools that you have at your disposal, the resources that you have at your disposal, and uh, and 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 solve the problem, get the job done that you need to. And this is going back to that initial comment that we. Uh, the small scale woodlot management typically is going to be uh, improvising rather than capitalizing. And then finally, there are some tasks that can't be or shouldn't be done. You're going to look at some things and you're going to say, that looks dangerous, or you're going to say, I think I can probably do that, but I don't know how to do that today, and I want to get some additional insights from some other people, and you'll wait, and that's the right thing to do. There's, there's nothing that's, that's in our woods that is so pressing that we need to uh, risk our safety. So um, uh, 
uh, look at each situation critically. We're not about productivity. We're about making sure we get out of the woods at the end of the day so that we can go back the next time. Okay, so with that as, a, as kind of a backdrop, I came up with um, six suggestions and I'm sure that there are a lot more and that's when we get to the end of this or as we're going through if something comes to mind then please pop those uh, into the chat pod so that we can we'll have they'll be recorded and we can come back and capture those uh, but here are the six and we're going to go through each one of them individually and I'll, I'll show a couple of pictures and offer a couple of additional thoughts so the first one is to embed your clear vision of your property into a written plan. So there, there are two key pieces that you have to have a vision for what you want your property to look like. And then secondly, that needs to be captured in a written plan. It's okay to have a mental plan, but a mental plan is not as effective as a written plan. Your state forestry agency can work with you to, for free to develop a written management plan if you want a more detailed plan, you work through a private consulting forester or an industrial forester who can write that plan, give you a detailed analysis of your different uh, parts of your property, and then a work schedule. So you need to consider all your objectives when you're, when you're thinking about uh, how to, uh, what parts of your vision to include. It may be that you want to be planting trees and being involved in reforestation. It may be that you're interested in wildlife and so you're trying to create wildlife habitats or maybe you're trying to create trails so that you can get out into your woods and see the wildlife. Uh, those trails may be used for winter or summer or whatever kinds of recreation. And then maybe it's some kind of a utilization. You want to cut your own boards. You want to saw logs and have your neighbor cut boards with uh, whatever it is. There are lots of objectives and, and those can typically all uh, mesh together fairly nicely. But have a written plan and review that plan with your forester. Second, uh, to create and maintain trails. This was the, um, this was I think maybe the first lesson that I learned when I started in Extension Forestry and started working with private landowners was you have to have trails because the trails give you both short and long-term benefits. Uh, in, a, in the short term, when you're working on a particular project, if you're moving wood or you're trying to get to and from someplace, it allows you to access safely access the work site. Um, by clearing the trail, you're going to be able to better maintain your equipment. There's less wear and tear on your equipment. The equipment that small-scale woodlot owners have is not designed to drive through brush the same way a skidder or a forwarder or a bulldozer is. So it's it's worth the investment of time to clear the trail, get the brush off to the side so that you can get in and out. Now this is a, a trail from my woods um, and it's it's one of our primary access trails so it's it's more clear than what I would make if I was just going to uh, go in and, and remove some logs. And then finally, once you have those trails, those provide long-term access for multiple uses. So we use these trails for cross-country skiing, for snowshoeing, uh, for accessing uh, deer hunting tree stands, uh, just taking the dog for a walk. So that it, you get multiple benefits um, for a long period of time. I think that there's value, and this might be something that that you all could react to who have done these kinds of things. Uh, but my sense is that there's a benefit if you focus your effort by location and objective, um, and then you're able to emphasize or demonstrate the progress that you have made. So you focus on a few acres per year. And you can say this is uh, an area that was released for crop tree management of these uh, red oak trees. By focusing on a few acres a year, and on a particular objective, in this case it was timber production, you're able to, to enhance the, the visual impact. So you can go to that area, the work that you, done was con that you did was concentrated, and you can visualize and say, okay, I've accomplished something here. I think it makes the work more efficient because you're going into the same location, you're more familiar with that, and if you have to build trails, then you're not building trails um, in any one year throughout the entire property, particularly some of these smaller work trails and so your your 
trail building investment is minimized. Um, along those lines, if you focus your work based on your owner objectives so that the objectives define the priorities, whether you're interested in improving forest health by cutting uh, diseased trees or dealing with some uh, control of interfering vegetation, uh, whatever it is, your, your work task priorities should align with your ownership objectives. So that when you, when you get done, you can say, that was time well spent. We had an objective to, uh, to control beach in our, in our forest, and that was the priority of the work that was accomplished. And then as, as you'll see with, with, I think, the next owner suggestion, is that you can take whatever these um, activities are and get double duty from them. So you can use these to make wildlife habitat. You can use these to make firewood, whatever it might be. Yep, and here it is. So optimize with multiple objectives for each task. So each time you do something, think about how you can, since you've already made some investment of time and energy and maybe materials, think about how you can uh, take advantage of that investment to satisfy other objectives. A good example of that is with crop tree management. So this is a, a schematic of, of crop trees and you have the dark green is your crop tree and you've identified the four quadrants and then you've removed the competing trees on at least two or up to four sides of this particular tree. How does that meet the objectives, multiple objectives? Well, you've enhanced the growth of this tree and it may be that you've picked your crop tree that satisfies both a timber objective and a wildlife objective and the trees that you remove are, are uh, stems that you will utilize for firewood production or for wildlife habitat. And you can visualize the intensity of this. This is a two-sided release where this, this particular crop tree uh, is released on this side and then again on this side. And the same thing here, release here and release here. Um, and this isn't a presentation on crop tree management. Jeff Ward's going to be talking about that in a couple of months. Um, but just to, to show you some uh, visuals of this, and here's a four-sided release, you can see a much greater release. There are some reasons why you may not want to release a tree as aggressively as a four-sided release. Um, uh, one that often gets overlooked is the amount of briar production that results from that much sunlight coming in. But if your objective is to pick blackberries and raspberries and, and freeze them for the winter, then there's an added benefit. Okay, the fifth suggestion is uh, basically about networking. Um, there are other people that are involved in small-scale woodlot management, and they're a great source of information. So uh, you, you already have some friends, and your friends have talents, and you can draw on those talents and take advantage of what they have to offer. But your friends also have limitations, and sometimes you can it's, it's difficult, depending upon the nature of the relationship you have with your friend, uh, setting boundaries um, that, that they will respect. And this is particularly relevant when it comes to safety. So just because your friend owns a chainsaw and they're willing to go out and help you in the woods does not mean that you should let them. So profile your friends, learn what they have to offer, but then expand your neighborhood. Find other people that you can connect with and share ideas you know, offer, you know, to, uh, to swap afternoons of working and, you know, you help me for four hours and I'll help you for four hours kinds of things. So those, those networking opportunities allow you to, I think of as share and steal ideas. So you, you know, there's somebody famous sometimes said there's nothing new, no new ideas under the sun. Uh, and that certainly goes along here. There's a lot that, that uh, we can learn from other people and we can meet up with those other owners by getting involved with Forest Owners Association associations. Every state has them in New York. It's the New York Forest Owners Association. Cooperative Extension, typically in, in most states, I think, that are, that are participating today has groups of trained volunteers 
Uh, they go by different names. Some of them are called uh, forest stewards in New York. They're called master forest owner volunteers or coverts volunteers, um, master woodland volunteers, things like that. But if you call your cooperative extension office, uh, you can find out when they're having workshops on uh, woodland management. And you can also ask about the trained volunteers. Incidentally, in terms of workshops, uh, I'll be in Columbia County, New York, this Saturday morning. Uh, if anybody's interested, we'll be doing a small-scale woodlot management and ATV logging workshop. It's about a four-hour session, and you'll need to uh, register through Cornell Cooperative Extension of Greene County. If anybody's interested, I can give you the information. And then finally, learn how to utilize trees, but do it safely. Uh, and, and when I've thought of the safety advice that I've gotten over the years, uh, the, the piece that's most meaningful is don't rush, focus on the task, or another way to think about that is to be where you are. And when you're cutting down a tree, um, you're thinking about cutting down that tree. You're not thinking about uh, the argument that you had with your spouse in the morning. You're not thinking about taking kids to swim team. You're not thinking about uh, fixing the muffler on your old truck. You're thinking about this, this machine that can do damage to you and this tree that can do damage to you. As soon as your mind starts to wander, you should stop doing what you're doing and uh, clear your brain, quit for the day, whatever it is. Remember, it's not about productivity. It's about getting out of the woods safely. Another aspect of, of utilizing trees is to pick equipment that's going to match um, what you desire to produce on an annual basis in the products that you're going to produce. Uh, moving wood can be a significant challenge. Um, it's it's and, and this is where you start getting into some ex, some expenses. You can move wood maybe as easy as saying, I'm just I'm going to hire a a local contractor with a bulldozer to put in a three season road that I can access with my old four wheel drive truck and I'll throw firewood in the back of it. And that may be perfectly sufficient. Uh, it may be that you have the, the interest in moving, um, moving logs so that you can make boards or beams, or you want to feed your sawmill or you want to feed your brother-in-law's sawmill, whatever it is, or you need a cart that you can pull behind your ATV, something. Uh, the safety aspect um, depends upon appropriate training, and there are several different training programs out there. The best one in the Northeast, and it's throughout the Northeast, is what's called Game of Logging for Landowners. Uh, Game of Logging, and some of you I know have taken Game of Logging courses. Game of Logging was initially developed for loggers by Soren Erickson and has been expanded to include a landowner version. It's called game because the process of felling the trees, you are scored. So here's Bill Lindloff and Bill Lindloff again. And Bill is instructing one of the participants and he is getting scored um, based on what he does correctly and what he does incorrectly. At the end of the day, you tally up the points and the winner gets a t-shirt or a couple of wedges or something like that. Um, but it, it's, a, it's an immensely valuable training program. And at the end of the day, even though each person it's a, is, uh, fells one tree, the rest of the people are involved in the discussion of felling that tree. And at the end of the day, you feel like you felled 10 trees rather than just one. Okay, so we have a couple of uh, comments here. Norm says, another use example... Uh, 38 acre, 37 acre timber harvest and then 900 tons of firewood. So, yeah, so you have, you know, you can multiple objectives, multiple, the skid trails were already in place. Uh, you could talk to your harvester and say, you know, when you're done as part of the contract, you need to leave these trails accessible so that I can get in and out with my ATV. Um, and then Janine says, one skill I would like to comfortably master is using a large chainsaw. Uh, uh, Janine, if, if you can find access to a game of logging training 
And if I remember, you said you're in Shenango County. Is that right? Um, we offer, there are, in central New York, there are game of logging trainings that are offered every year. Um, and your local extension office can, or you can contact me directly, and we can get you on our game of logging email list. For those of you of New, in New York, um, if you host game of logging, uh, let me know, and I'll be happy to help advertise that. So I offer them only because I think it's essential that landowners have access to this type of training. And I'm not an instructor. I just host the, host the trainings. Okay, another aspect of utilization is to know your limitations. Um, you have to know your own capacity, and you have to know... Um, uh, know how to use the tools uh, that you have access to. And I put up this picture with a great deal of humility. Um, this was uh, a tree that was on our property. And I don't remember what about it uh, made us want to cut it down. It was, it, had, uh, it was leaning a little bit over a trail. And uh, my first mistake was that I... I, was, I agreed to cut this down with my wife watching. Uh, then the, the second mistake was she convinced me that I could use wedges to get the tree to fall into the woods rather than across the trail. And it was close enough to the trail I would have only had to deal with the stem on the trail. I should have gone with my gut instincts, but she says, well, she had taken game of logging level one. And she said, well, you know, when Bill did this, he just put a wedge in there, he tapped it in, and the tree fell where he wanted it to go. So I tried that. I don't remember which my first wedge was. Maybe that was my first wedge. And you can see that it, it was a downhill slide. Um, I don't remember how I exactly got this tree down. I did get it to go where I wanted it to go, but I, I had overextended my capacity and overextended my knowledge base. This worked out okay. In other situations, you overextend yourself or you overextend your capacity and you end up severely injured or um, dead. So... Know your limitations. Okay, on the forester side, we'll go through the same basic uh, process in terms of suggestions. And here, um, what, where I'm moving with this is I think that there is a, is a huge opportunity for foresters to expand uh, the number of people that they have interactions with. So it's, it's a way to, to build your client base, and it's a way for... Um, uh, it, it's and I, and I say that unabashedly is, you know, forest landowners need foresters, foresters need landowners. And so to make those connections is a valuable connection. Um, but I think that foresters have, uh, at least many of the foresters that I've interacted with or, or, or observed have, have too narrowly defined how they're going to do business. So the first of these is to investigate owner dynamic demographics and consider the opportunity to build relationships. This is really selling you on the idea, you foresters, on the idea that uh, you should consider expanding how you're going to work. Um, and the, the, the point that I will make here is based upon some recent sociological research that's been done through the U.S. Forest Service, as this particular data shows um, I know that there are other groups, the University of Massachusetts and Cornell University and Penn State University and other universities have done work on what are called typologies or profiling landowners to understand what makes them tick. And the basic pattern, at least in New York, and is I think fairly common throughout most of the Northeast, although the numbers will vary, is that a big fraction of landowners, their primary motivation deals with looking at their property as a retreat. They're not about growing timber. Now, that doesn't mean they're opposed to timber. That doesn't mean they're opposed to wildlife. Uh, and they may have those as very strong interests, but primarily they view their property as a retreat. Then there, then there are, are woodland owners who view it as working the land. This is a chance they see their woodlot as a garden. And that's, I think, where I would fall in. Um, smaller numbers are thinking about their woodlands for supplemental income. And uh, then there's another cluster that's, that's uh, ill-defined. But the trick then is for foresters who want to look at half of the owners, and in New York, uh, half of the owners would amount to about 300,000 people, what services can you provide to somebody 
whose primary interest is their woodland as a retreat. It's not a matter of uh, producing board feet. So it's thinking about what are their other needs, and we'll look at some of those. In order to do that, if your focus isn't on board feet, you're going to need to adjust your fee structure. Because a lot of foresters tend to think about forestry as timber sales. Forestry is about managing the woods to accomplish the landowner's objectives. And if you have a fee structure that's tied um, intimately to a timber sale, particularly as a commissioned base fee structure, you need to be more creative and say, all right, maybe what I need to do is charge on a per hour basis or on a, on a uh, task basis. Uh, but think outside the box and think about how you can connect with a broader range of woodland owners. Think about, and this is where we, when we, when we, when we go back to the opportunities to build relationships, you need to identify the owners. One way to do that is to identify the owner's capacity and their needs relative to their objectives. So there may be a standard objective for wildlife habitat, but owner A has a different aptitude for accomplishing that than owner B. So you can think about how you can provide services for owner A and owner B, both for the same objective. It may be, and we saw this picture earlier, maybe that you're going to go out and you're going to mark the trees for the owner to cut. Um, and maybe you're going to spend time teaching them that process at a, at a small scale where they're working with you know, fairly low value uh, wooded areas so that they can then they can then do that decision making in the future. That's you know that's not going to mean that they're not going to call you back. If you build that strong relationship with them, they'll continue to call you back. But getting them started, providing essentially providing them some technical assistance, um, you're gonna you're gonna know them and they're gonna know you and and that will be a powerful relationship. And maybe you're going to apply herbicides. Uh, it, it maybe you're just going to help them get started. You're going to spend some time with them explaining how to read a pesticide label. You're going to um, uh, connect them with their local cooperative extension office so that they can get training in pesticide certification or, or just the basics of pesticide use. Or maybe you're going to do the actual work yourself, which means that you will be uh, become a certified applicator. We talked about trails. There's a lot of a lot of woodland out there that will benefit from somebody sitting down with a map, designing some trails, maybe marking the trails, and then uh, maybe going so far as to working with a contractor to install those trails. That's as a forester. That of course is to your benefit because then you will know that those trails will be of a quality and a design that will be useful um, for future activities. Help the landowner make money. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to make money. Uh, timber sales certainly provide a, a significant pulse of income at a particular point in time. But if what we're thinking about is small scale, sustained yield, sustained revenue, then it may happen on in very different ways. And by helping landowners get in things such involved with things such as gourmet mushroom production, maple syrup production, or silvopasturing. Uh, small ruminants, uh, those are things that because you're not going to do that work as a forester, but you might help them understand how doing these types of projects uh, interface with their other ownership objectives and thinking about the logistics of making that happen. So you're truly serving in a consulting capacity. The owners that get involved in these I'll argue are going, to, are going to be more comfortable with their woods, are going to be more knowledgeable, they're going to be more likely to do and, and participate in a greater number of different tasks, uh, seeking out your assistance for a greater number of tasks. And then finally, uh, because some landowners are going to be interested in small-scale woodland management and low-impact harvesting, but they're not going to have the physical ability or the um, or the equipment to do the job, they will look to you to recommend other local service providers. So you need to, uh, as foresters, find um, have a list of people that own forwarders and feller bunchers for some of your clients, but for other clients, you're going to need to, uh, to to provide other kinds of information. You're going to need to find contractors who are willing to apply 
standard silvicultural principles at a small scale. This is a, a one acre patch clear cut seed tree cut that I put in on our property. Uh, but finding an operator that could come in and would be willing to work on a one acre scale is, is something to do. Um, quality and care are the priorities that the owners have for the people that are working in their woods. And then finding a variety of, of, of um, equipment isn't quite the right word, uh, resources that these owners can draw from. So finding, uh, you know, this was a, a workshop that was put on, I think, by Jim Wilkins here, who's a forester with Wagner Lumber um, and, and is involved in horse logging on the side. Um, and they had an afternoon last winter where they brought in horses and, and, a forester could go to that and collect names and phone numbers and talk to the talk to the contestants and say how far do you travel, where do you live, how willing, how much are you willing to work, and so forth. So uh, Gil's asking, how would you find out what foresters might be willing to consult in the way in which you describe? Uh, it'll uh, it'll be the same way that you would find um, a forester to. to um, uh, to complete other kinds of tasks, you will, and I have a, a publication if you go to my website, which is forestconnect.info, and then go to, and that was down earlier today, but I'm told that it's back up. Uh, if you go to the publications link, and then there's a, uh, a bulletin that we have written on forest stewardship or something like that. And there's a chapter in there on working with foresters. And those of you that are members of the New York Forest Owners Association, the next issue is the next issue is of the Forest Owner Magazine has an article that that a variation of that article. So we have some other comments. Uh, public foresters are a good source of information either through DEC. Um, oh, and Evan says it's still down. Did I type in the right address? ForestConnect.info. Did I get three W's up there? Well, come back to it, and hopefully it'll be up or do a refresh on it. Okay, now we have a, a few minutes, and I want to hit on some strategies for low-impact logging. I want to leave some time also because uh, you all aren't getting off, um, uh, getting off the hook without offering some additional thoughts and comments on this. But low-impact logging... A few points I'll make here. Um, things like low impact is more about the operator than the equipment. And I'll have, and foresters will hear um, landowners saying, you know, I don't want that big machine that's going to make a mess in my woods. Um, and we have had, I know, as, as director of the Cornell Arnott Forest, we where we very seriously and aggressively practice commercial scale forestry, we have had a lot of big equipment, but it's run by people who are conscientious about what they're doing. So it's more about the operator than it is about the equipment. I've already mentioned that low impact is low productivity. Um, with all of these low impact logging, um, you're going to have to be creative in your strategies and solutions. Um, uh, and, and, you know, simply because in every you know, every day and every every hour, there's something new that comes up, and that's that's the fun part because you find those solutions and then you learn from those. Hopefully, you learn from those, and then you're able to draw on that knowledge base as you move forward. Um, and don't be afraid to make mistakes. Go ahead and try it. The trick is to only make the mistake once, uh, and then learn from that and do things differently. So, to illustrate some of those points, you know, the machine size versus operator attention. And this is, uh, this is a skidder that used to be owned by one of our um, contractors, Frank Miller. Um, it's a big, full-size John Deere skidder. And he could work in the woods, and we would let him work year-round because he had such a uh, level of conscientiousness that um, he just did not damage our woods. And, you know, in the winter, in the, in the spring, there were some areas that we restricted him from. Um, the ground was softer, there would be rutting, but he would always fix those. Uh, we, we didn't lose uh, productivity or develop water quality issues. We didn't have banged up trees. Um, this is the Cornell ATV, which is an Arctic Cat 700cc uh, diesel. 
obviously these two machines can accomplish very different things um, and put the wrong person on an ATV and they can do a lot of damage in your woods. As you're working through uh, harvesting, think about each step of the process and it's better to do that before you actually start the process. So the whole process begins of course when you uh, walk out the door in the morning and uh, and you think about okay I need my chainsaw and I need my fuel and I need my bar oil and I need water to stay hydrated and I need snacks and I need a whatever it is uh, that you take with you and you think through where you're going to work and the kinds of activities that you're going to do uh, and work all the way through that and as you as each as you move from one phase to the next reevaluate all future phases and all future steps to make sure that you haven't missed something. This is this picture illustrates a, a learning experience that I had. It was after I had already made the mistake, but I had uh, on in, in our woods, I'm stockpiling the logs and I'm putting them on these uh, what I call bunk logs until I have time to process them. I had a need to to get the trees felled and um, up off the ground and, and into common areas. And the first time I did this, I brought the ATV and arch in, and I had my bunk logs in place, and I dropped my, um, I'll call that a saw log, small saw log, but it's a saw log nonetheless. Um, I dropped it on the ground, and then I thought, oh, I have to get my saw log, I have to get it lifted up eight or ten inches on top of my bunk logs. So after that, I cut these about five foot long, um, I don't know what you want to call them, um, spacers or shims or something like that. And before I'd drop my saw log, I'd put the, the spacers or shims underneath it, and that allowed me to more easily get my saw log up on top of my bunk logs. So this is just, you know, that's a, that's a solution that's peculiar to my situation, but if I had thought about the process in advance before I dropped the log on the ground, I would have saved myself a lot of frustration. And, and the first log that I dropped directly on the ground was a lot bigger than this one and a lot harder to get up on the bunks. Um, cut your stumps low. With your ATVs, you're going to have a clearance of, of uh, maybe 8 to 10 to, to 12 inches. So keep your stumps cut low. Of course, when you're felling, you wouldn't necessarily try and cut them that low. And you can see those of you that are in full screen will look at the stump and say, where's your hinge? Here's the hinge over here. I've, I've surfaced off the three or four inches of this so that I can have a low stump for getting over with my ATV and the arch and moving the logs. Use your tools. Um, those of you that have participated in the ATV workshop that I've been doing around New York um, know there are a couple of tools that I carry on the on the Cornell arch. One of them is a PV, and then I also have a choker poker. Um, and this is just a, a picture showing how I'm using the PV. The ground slopes um, on, on the uphill side on the left, downhill to the right, and I'm trying to get this log to slide inside the arch, and it kept rolling in and catching on the back end on the right uh, side of the arch. So I took my PV and essentially just made a, a bumper, a temporary bumper, so that it would, so the log would then slide. Uh, it's pulled in on this winch line cable um, on, into, the, into the arch. But use your tools. Find the tools. The point here is use your tools. Uh, uh, work with tools that are dependable, high-quality tools. Keep them close to you so that you're more likely to use them. Um, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Plan and build trails first. Um, I this is again this actually probably took me a couple of times to teach myself this, so I'm I'm not always following uh, what I'm preaching. Um, and this is also a little quiz, as I recall. I have there are one, two, three, four things as you look at this picture, and and you don't need to type these into the chat pod, but there are four things that. Um, are, are specific to the concept of planning and building trails first. So let's take 10 seconds and see if you can identify what those are from this picture.
All right, that's about 10 seconds. So you can see how many of these you had. So we have a low stump here in the lower left-hand corner. The trail is on the contour, and that's important because uh, ATVs and farm tractors um, are are not designed or are, are have different engineering designs than skidders and forwarders, and they're much easier to roll. Uh, the the slope that you can operate, the side slope that you can operate on with this equipment is very different. So you need to be conscious about planning your trees or planning your trails. I I topped off. This was a tree. I don't know why I topped it off. Um, but I topped it off and left it as a bumper tree to protect this pine. Now most of the time I'm, I'm, when I'm working with the arch, the log is suspended and I don't have to worry about rounding the corner, but if I was to use this trail um, to drag firewood out, um, skid it behind the arch, then that bumper tree would be handy. And then the fourth thing was I'd cleared the brush out of the way to make a safe access trail. All right, we've We've talked a little bit about planning for the end result. Um, this is, and using physics, um, this is a, a log um, skidway that, I've, that I have in place so that I can put the logs on the same plane, same height as my arch. I'm sorry, as my sawmill. Okay, so uh, here I want to get your ideas and your tips. Um, as a woodland owner, what would you tell other woodland owners? As a forester, what would you tell other foresters? Um, and while you're thinking of that, um, I'm going to put up some websites. And this is the end of the presentation. So I'm going to bring some of these down. And I'm going to move this like this. And I'm going to bring up a link for an exit survey. And I want all of you to participate in, if you would, please. Okay, so what do you have for ideas or thoughts or other kinds of contributions to this? And here are some links. I don't know if you all um, can hit those links or not, um, but those are links to some my, my website, the Cornell Forestry Extension Woodlot Management website, um, the Maryland study, uh, and this is a good, there's a, it's, a, it's a long report, but it's worth taking a look at. The arch that I showed pictures of was modeled after the log ride. I had that custom made and I think enhanced, um, but I want to give credit to log ride because they have, I think, one of the, the best commercially available logging arches. Uh, West Virginia Extension has some good information, and I oftentimes go to Bailey's and forestry suppliers. Okay, so here are some comments. Chris says log rights based in Connecticut. Yes, I see them. They bring. They always have a display at the uh, Woodsman's Field Days in Boonville. And those of you in in the north, those of you everywhere, I'm sure that there are kind of forestry woodlot logger field days in your state or your communities. Um, so seek those out and it's a great place to go and, and you know, sometimes you go and look look at the commercial size stuff and you think oh you know that's a great tool it's more than I need but I can modify it or I can use something device at home or on the farm to accomplish the same thing. So John um, adds in, forest owners should seek out a management plan. The management plan is a great tool. Uh, a management plan will define the uh, characteristics of the property. It will define the objectives of the owner. It will identify what the woodlot is going to be like in the future. And then it will prioritize work tasks, work activities with a schedule uh, based on what the owner can accomplish so that the woodlot will become what the owner wants it to become. Okay, Janine says, keep up your skills by continually learning and taking classes. Um, okay, uh, I agree with that. I mean, that's kind of my, that's what I do is through Cooperative Extension. Um, and I, I get a great deal out of um, the chance to interact with landowners. And I, 
I'm, I, you know, I need to admit um, that a lot, you know, as I said earlier, there's nothing new under the sun, no new ideas. And so I do a lot of, um, uh, get a lot of ideas from woodland owners and from foresters when I have the opportunities to get out and uh, meet with them. Okay, so comments on uh, management plans for in terms of carbon sequestration. Okay, Winnie has a good point. If you have uh, an ATV um, or a full-size UTV, and you can, a lot of ATVs will have uh, trailer hitches. You can tow your splitter with you if you're interested in firewood. Go out into the woods, fell buck split right in the woods, um, and then go back with a cart. Or I guess with the UTV, you have a, a box on the back of the UTV where you can stack the wood. Um, and then just make sure you tarp it for um, tarp your equipment so that you keep everything dry. Terry points out keeping logs clean and in, in small sawmills is a really good point. That's that for me is the real advantage of the arch because the saw logs are suspended. It does two things. The two advantages there are there's no friction. And so the arches, the log ride arch and the arch that um, I had custom made, once that log is suspended, uh, and both of those arches can handle a 25 inch diameter log, you almost don't feel that log as you're, as you're driving with it. Um, you don't feel it certainly as you're driving, you, where you do feel it is when you're heading downhill and you have that, uh, the weight behind you. So make sure you're in low gear and moving slow and you've planned your trail so that you don't have sharp corners on an incline. Okay, Don says, I use a Kubota RTV, four foot firewood and fir pulp. Uh, RTV is covered and has rollover protection. That's important. And, 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 and anything that deals with safety um, is a worthwhile investment. Good, focus on safety. Chainsaw safety and felling best course. I agree. We have we have offered the game of logging. Um, everybody that I've known that's ever taken game of logging has said that it's you know one of the best best educational experiences they've ever had. And these are people that have you know had all kinds of educational experiences in their life. Stephanie says state and federal programs often financial and technical assistance, forest management plans and practices, Pincho Institute. Common Waters Partnership will launch a new cost share program in the Upper Delaware River. Okay, good. That's good to know. Um, well, uh, the Upper Delaware River, River, is that the New York Upper Delaware River or different? Maybe you can give us the state or counties for that. But very good point. Look to your state agencies and federal agencies. They have financial and technical assistance. Um, every state has a state um, forestry agency and what are called public service foresters or cooperative forestry management programs. Um, they're available. They come prepaid with your tax dollar and um, uh, they can assist you and get you started. So, Okay, so there we have um, New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey counties. So if you're in those counties and you see you have Stephanie's email address there and you can connect in. So, all right, other, other from a forester's perspective, are there the foresters that have already started dabbling with uh, woodland owners on small woodlot management and building some new types of business models? Are there, are there thoughts or ideas that I missed? Or do you have, some of you maybe have some questions um, that you want to offer here? How often should the management plan be updated? Bob asks. Uh, most management plans uh, would probably be updated on a 10-year basis. Um, I'd say it wouldn't hurt to chat with your forester at least every five years, if not more frequently. Uh, anytime something major happens, if you have an insect defoliation, if you have 
you start to see some forest health issues, if you start to see an influx of invasive plants coming in, uh, spend some time with your forester and just make sure that that you don't need to adjust your work schedule. Similarly, you may have changes in your what's happening in your life and uh, that you have a change in needs, a change in desires, a change. Maybe you retire and you say, holy cow, I've got all this time on my hands. I need to do something. So get a hold of your forester. And, and so any kinds of kind of life changing events. Okay. Terry says, best pub seen cutting logs for milling custom saw milling by Doug Anderson in the Wooden Boat Magazine. Interesting. Okay. Terry, if you can uh, share that with, um, if, there's a, if there's a more um, explicit connection to that um, and you send it to me, then in all of these points, what I'll try and do is, is summarize these. And there is, when my website is up and running, There, we have a Woodland Owner Forum that's part of the Forest Connect webpage. And at that forum, there are uh, six categories of questions. We have wildlife, maple syrup, uh, agroforestry, woodlot management, forest health, insects and disease, and then maybe other. And I will capture these ideas and just share them as a, as a point of interest in the woodlot management section. So probably what I'll do is I'll just copy and paste uh, this chat pod so that people you know, like Stephanie who have an email address or others um, will be given credit for the contributions that they've made. So look for that. Um, there's also when you go to that exit survey that you see at the top of the page and I truly don't want you to um, ignore that because I depend upon those exit surveys to help guide the direction of this webinar series. Um, there's a place where you can ask additional questions. You know, we'll, we'll sign off here in a couple of minutes, and you may end up with a question. If you plug in those questions in at the appropriate place in that survey, I'll provide answers to those and summarize them in that Woodland Owner Forum. So go to that. The forum, and the forum is is not geographically constrained. So if you have questions or thoughts from, you know, we have people from Nebraska and Virginia uh, up to Maine, all, you know, every state in between is welcome to, to dive into that form and ask questions and then respond to questions. So, okay, and when he says, Game of Logging Level 1 and 2 scheduled in Central New York, um, December 8th and 9th, no known location. So uh, get a hold of, so Winnie, if you want to host those, you need to get a hold probably of Bill Lindloff and work uh, through Bill to host those. I know Nor Northern New York had some a special grant for farmers, and I don't know how broadly they defined farmers, if that also include maple producers and woodlot owners, but Northern New York was going to be having a series of game of logging trainings you know, at very low cost or maybe free for farmers uh, several dates from now through the end of December that Bill Lindloff was signed up for. Last I heard, I think all of those were full. So, um, But it might be worth contacting. If you're in northern New York, contact your local cooperative extension office and see if they know about that or contact um, Bill Lindloff. And there is a, uh, uh, I think there is a uh, game of logging website that will connect you with the instructors um, if you want to get more information. So uh, Nevin, hi Nevin, by the way. Um, different pricing structures for small landowners. I don't know of too many landowners who are too many foresters who have widely varied pricing structures based on the size of the property. I do know that there are different pricing structures out there. Uh, one of the one of the common strategies is for foresters to charge uh, on a commission basis 
uh, for timber sales. And so they'll charge some percentage of, of a commission based on the total value of the timber sale. Um, and you can read my article. I think that there are some, um, some things that landowners should think about before they get into that type of a pricing structure. Other foresters charge on an hourly basis. Um, they're, I mean, with any, any pricing structure is going to have the, the potential for abuse. So just like uh, it's not about the size of the equipment that you use, it's about the, the, uh, the attitudes of the operator, the same would hold true for the foresters. Um, the, the downside of the commission-based pricing structure is if a landowner wants you to come out and spend half a day or two and a half days marking low-grade pine, uh, a forester would lose their shirt if they charged based on the value of the trees that they marked. So they, they need to be able to develop some of these other pricing structures. The foresters that I know that charge by an hour seem to be very happy with that and um, also seem to be um, uh, very busy. So, and, and Pat points out, you know, some landowners were resistant to that. Uh, partly because they're unaccustomed to it. And and I've talked to foresters that, that tried to go that route and landowners, um, and this was the forester I talked to, was trying earnestly to have the, the landowner go with the price per hour for a timber sale. And the owner just thought, that's too complicated, give me a percentage. Um, I, I know that for some hardwood saw log sales, um, the hourly rate works out to be anywhere from two to five percent of the sale, whereas a common uh, commission in, in that I hear about in New York is in the twelve to fifteen percent. So that the hourly rate um, and foresters need to be fairly compensated, but the hourly rate usually costs the landowner less. Um, but foresters, I think, probably don't charge as much as they could charge on an hourly basis, or I shouldn't say could charge, uh, the value that they bring is more than what they're charging. But it's, it's, there's a learning curve for landowners. You know, when, you, when you look at, you think about the advice that a, a forester brings, good advice to a landowner is going to have an impact that may last centuries on that property and, and, and has value to the landowner in the thousands of dollars. So, um, from a value pricing um, um, theory, um, one of the strategies is to price based on the value of the product to the consumer. So, Pat's is also a per job rate. So, okay, well, um, I think that I'm going to call this, we'll wrap this up. I have an off-campus appointment I need to be at at 2 p.m., but uh, please do take a take a moment to. I'm going to turn off the record.